and suddenly you eliminate a lot of potential for confusion. Because what data scientists are really good at is finding answers to, uh, to problems. This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is powered by Z by HP. HP's high compute, workstation grade, line of products and solution. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Jakob Jurovi. He's the founder and CEO of DeepNote, where he and his team are developing a collaborative data science notebook. Jakob studied computer science at Cambridge University, focusing on human computer interaction, machine learning and computer vision. As an engineer, Jakob built tools for JavaScript development and worked on Firefox dev tools. Later in his career, Jakob became the CTO of Opram, a company using machine learning for better marketing at companies and Hollywood studios. Jakob is also a Y Combinator alumnus and a Forbes 30 under 30. In this episode, we have an awesome conversation about project management and data science. We also talk about some of the similarities and differences between data science teams and software engineering teams and how you go about managing them. At the end, we dive deep into the origin of his company, DeepNote. Jakob, thank you so much for coming in today. I'm really excited to, to speak with you and interview you today. It's been a long time coming. I know time zone wise, it's a little bit difficult for, for us to, to get on the same page, but you're the founder of DeepNote, an incredible platform that is facilitating teams working together, doing really cool projects. And I just wanted to have you come in and tell your story of how you first got interested in technology all the way through the founding of this company and what you're doing now. Again, thank you for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks for a very kind of intro. <laughs> Wonderful. So the first topic that I always like to touch on with my guests is understanding how they first got that spark related to technology and data. Was it actually, in fact, a spark, a pivotal moment where you realized this was a wonderful career for you? Or was it this slow kind of methodical progress towards a, a career or towards this this understanding and interest in data? I would say that in my case, it was, it was a process. So when I originally started, um, I am first and foremost a software engineer. I mean, I've been doing this ever since I can remember. And I actually been building a lot of stuff in like related to developer tooling. Um, I got so also very interested in, in data visualizations early on, but I was always pretty much a software engineer. I kind of got deep into, into some topics um, around programming languages, um, you know, advanced debuggers and, and similar things. Um, and as I just got deeper and deeper into this topic, I started to contribute to a bunch of open source projects and trying to see how far we can push the whole experience. Um, then suddenly, um, I essentially became a CTO of a data anal analytics company. And even though I had some background before, mainly in machine learning and data science, this was kind of really an eye-opening moment for me. As a, as a CTO, I was suddenly managing two teams. I was managing both an engineering team and I was also managing a data science team. And it became very clear that you just can't go and say, hey, these are decades of well-known, battle-tested software engineering best practices. All you have to do is to take them and apply them to a team of data scientists. Um, so we started to iterate and experiment on how we can do, uh, how we can better set up the, the processes and, and the workflows in, in our data science team. And as you can imagine, well, data science is relatively younger um, industry. The tools are not as mature as we might be expecting them from, you know, from certain software engineering world. And we have seen this quite, quite heavily, like essentially, all the tools that we had at our disposal as data scientists and data analysts were essentially a transformation of some kind of uh, tool which was really built for software engineers. So when we are talking about, you know, how do we uh, access databases? Like traditionally, you are still mostly using like a SQL editors and, you know, like this old school uh, 
tools which were, which were primarily built for database admins, not as much for, for analysts. If you're writing your models, you are again thrown into this ID world. Like essentially you have all these super powerful tools, but then again, they were more built for like debugging of your, of your code and shipping real large stuff uh, and scaling, uh, scaling it across, you know, like hundreds of servers. Um, there was really that, that element of exploration that was missing. And that's, that was actually quite, a, quite an interesting realization that the exploratory programming has been around for quite some time. It just kind of taken a backseat over the past couple of decades as people have been more and more focused on, uh, on software engineering. It was only in a couple of you know, recent years where data science kind of became, again, a thing big enough to uh, revive some of, the, some of those older ideas. So for example, like to be more concrete what I mean by this, when data science notebooks came along, like for example, when Jupyter was released, this was kind of seen as a pretty big deal for data scientists. Suddenly you were not required to be spending your time in the code editor, optimized for different things. You could have been spending your time in the environment, which was focused on exploration, on fast prototyping, on iteration, on communicating of your ideas. Like just the idea of, you know, putting a piece of text into your code editor is kind of strange. But if you're a data scientist and you are doing this on a daily basis, it's kind of like bread and butter. Like you have, you have some finding and of course you're going to be communicating what you, what you found there and describing the process behind it. Like, of course, you're going to be including plenty of charts and visualizations in your process. Um, so when data science notebooks came along, this was really like a really good fit for, uh, for data science workflows, but their, I would say their origins are actually tracing back, can be traced back all the way to like 1950s and 1960s. Like when we were thinking about this, first wave of um, of artificial intelligence because back then it was mostly about exploration and all the tools were built around exploration it just over the course of um, you know the upcoming decades the I kind of call it like the Java world took over and suddenly like everyone was like using this like heavyweight IDs and it kind of stuck with us so my my background and my introduction to data science was actually essentially looking at all these tools uh trying to keep the data science team as productive as possible trying to communicate all those findings and realizing that tools that are currently the standard meaning all these traditional um software uh like code editors and you know for example git for versioning didn't really fit the workflows that, that we are seeing. So that was my introduction and my kind of nudge towards exploring this a bit further. Um, and now I don't want to say that uh, software engineering tools are not great. They are absolutely amazing. And I did spend a lot of time uh, in that environment, but they were built for, for something different. And we realized that from all these things that we have learned uh, as, as a whole industry and literally decades of academic research, which kind of got forgotten, we can take inspiration from that and start building a new generation of data science tools. So that was mostly my interaction. Um, and I just got so excited about this whole topic and seeing the possibilities there that I just couldn't really stop like, thinking about it. And that's also how uh, DeepNode was born. That's incredible. You know, something that I think is really important and also very interesting is that when you moved into that CTO role, you did realize that you have to treat software engineers and data science differently because the workflows are different. I think, or, or I've worked with multiple CTOs where they, they come in and they say, we're going to run this data science team like a software engineering team. We're going to work on the same sprint cycles. We're going to use the same project management tools. We're going to use the same systems. And they think it's just going to work. 
And there's inevitably just, again, differences in the workflow, different differences in how the projects are structured. You have, you, for, for some things, like you can sort of estimate how long an exploratory analysis will take, right? But not to the yeah. extent that you can estimate uh, how, how long a software engineering project or, or like one portion of, of a software engineering project will take. I'd love to learn more about your experience discovering those differences, if you have any kind of concrete examples associated with that, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, how how you've defined the differences in the workflow aside from the tools i mean we're going to talk a lot about the tools in a little bit here but what are just the differences in in the style of the work or in the how the projects need to be managed things along those lines yeah so i don't want to overgeneralize, but exactly as you said uh if you have a data science team and you are following some kind of weekly cadence or like following some some scrum methodology something might not be completely right. Um, and there are some situations where uh, this is the correct uh, workflow for you, but let's be honest, 80% of the time, you're probably better off uh, figuring out a different model, how you uh, develop um, new ideas, how you test out the experiments, and how you essentially frame um, the way how you, how you work. So uh, probably the best way how to think about this is to essentially realize that when we talk about data scientists, there's an extremely wide spectrum of, uh, of different profession, professions and different workflows. Um, I spent some time uh, in, in the graphic design world, um, back when I was doing like all these visualizations and uh, doing graphic design and so on. And it's very interesting to see the, the similarities and analogies uh, from, from this world. You, like all of us can probably remember the times where um, you know, there was a Photoshop as the king for, for all, the, all the graphic designers. And uh, essentially you just had to master the tool and it was like go to think. But over time people realized that graphic designers, there are actually multiple types of them. There are people who are mainly uh, working with, uh, with photos, with bitmap, um, like raster images. Uh, then there were people who were primarily uh, working on illustrations. Um, and then there's a there are people who are primarily building um, uh, UIs and doing UX research and all these things. And suddenly people realize that, that one tool is not going to fit all these, all these different roles. And the same thing we are kind of seeing in, uh, in data science right now, that even if we have one kind of like overarching data science title, it's a wide spectrum. On the one hand of the spectrum, there could be people who are uh, something closer to an analyst, people who are really spending most of their time um, building, like really digging deep into, uh, into the stories behind, uh, behind data, like producing reports, uh, presenting it to other people. And most of their time, they are spe spending more time with uh, visualization tools, or um, you know, maybe they're writing some, some SQL or maybe a little bit of Python. But for them, really telling the story is uh, the output of, of their work. And whether they tell the story like through you know, a document, a PDF report, a PowerPoint presentation, or an infographic, um, it's essentially one way of, of doing things. Then you have a completely different uh, side of the spectrum. Um, these are people who are getting much closer to, let's say, um, data engineers or um, maybe even DevOps engineers or like DevOps people plus, um, plus software engineers who are still working with those models which were built by, by data scientists. Uh, but they are actually taking them and treating them more as a, as a traditional code, like versioning them, deploying them. And the output of their work is an application that or model that is shipped an API. and running yeah. exactly like running on uh, like deployed on, on clusters. So now they have like two completely different, different kinds of outputs. And uh, this is just such a vast difference in how you would structure your team around this. Um, if you are deploying a model, 
we can actually take a lot of inspiration or we can take a lot of experience from previous deployments and you're thinking, all right, we know roughly what works. We know how much compute power this needs. Uh, we know which technology we are going to use to deploy it. Uh, and we know how to monitor this. But if you are on the other side of the spectrum and you are trying to find a pattern in your data, it's literally impossible to tell how long it is going to take. If you have some experience as a data scientist, you're probably going to develop some kind of intuition and some kind of hunch that like you see this data, maybe you like this is the first thing where you're going to look at uh, to find like for finding some some patterns, but you really don't know what you're going to find out. And as a result, like estimating this this workflow or even trying to kind of like delegate it or split it across uh, across multiple team members is becoming significantly more difficult. Like suddenly the communication shifts uh, from this model of just leaving me alone, building my stuff and when it's ready, I'm going to push it to GitHub and ask for a review. So the communication shifts much earlier into that uh, workflow and you are you want to communicate at a level of, hey, I had this idea, this seems interesting, what do you think we should do next? Um, and you essentially are never going to get to like the full working version um, because you might be able to extract the, the insight even before you get to it and you can move on to the next, uh, next task and just you know keep learning new things. This episode is brought to you by Z by HP. HP's high compute workstation grade line of products and solutions. As datasets get larger, unraveling meaningful insights can become more time consuming and costly. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions, and I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z4 workstation. I really love that Z workstations can come standard with Linux, and they can be configured with the data science software stack. With the software stack, you can get right to the work of doing data science on day one, without the overhead of completely reconfiguring your new machine. These powerful machines are being used to solve real world problems as well. If you're a student and you want to get your hands on one of these, there's a great opportunity right this second. HP is hosting a Kaggle competition to identify and localize COVID-19 anomalies, and the student team that scores the highest will receive a top of the line ZBook Studio. Now back to our episode. That, that's so fascinating to me. You, you talked about how there is sort of uncertainty and when the insight comes or even if the insight comes, depending on what mm -hmm. your data says. From a managing perspective, how do you estimate projects or initiate projects? Because it's very difficult to determine what the ROI is on a data science project versus a software project. And I think that that's one reason why data science, it really struggles to get adoption in some companies because it's like, oh, you know, we want to do this project. And they say, how much money will it save us or make us? And you're like, well, we don't know yet, but it could be a lot. It could be a little. It's 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 a very difficult problem to have. And I'm, I'm interested because you were in that space. And I think you were also in a company that was heavily leveraging machine learning. Are there some insights or some learnings that managers could probably take away from your experience there? So probably one thing that a lot of people uh, don't realize is that you can get value out of your work even if you don't get to a final product. One way, I mean, this is this is already bad practice with with software engineers. But you know, like if you're a manager and need to find a way how to measure someone's productivity, I mean, yeah, the easiest thing out there is just to count the lump, like number of uh, lines of code uh, that someone produced. And it's a terrible proxy. It's just such a bad proxy. But at least uh, you can measure it. It's just so like readily available for you. Um, this, like now that we take this idea to uh, to data science world, like this gets to extreme. Like you can literally produce, you know, tens, maybe hundreds of reports, like all these different graphs and visualizations, and you will still essentially come up with nothing usable. Uh, but you are still going to extract uh, that insight. And that's also the reason why so many notebooks end up unfinished. Because your goal at the end of the day is not to push something to production. Your goal is not to uh, send something to your manager. Your goal really is about finding the insight, finding 
some interesting pattern and then taking it and applying it to, you know, a problem at hand, uh, whether it's like trying to figure out why our signups, uh, like signup rate have dropped uh, the past week or why we are seeing so much traffic from this one location. Like you don't really need to go all the way to produce that super polished notebook because if you find out that, oh my God, like we just deployed this new version uh, of, um, of our landing page around the time and we fo forgot to include the tracking code, there is not really the need, that much need to, to go and like build out the full report. Um, so this is, this is something that, uh, this is a trap that a lot of people fall into and they essentially try to um, measure the productivity of data scientists based on the outputs they produce. But in reality, the best data scientists actually know where to stop and know like what to do with the insight and know that the most valuable thing might be just to talk to the engineering team to fix the bug rather than going and like producing a nice Monday report uh, to a board of, uh, you know, um, uh, to board of like a leadership um, board of um, company and then trying to see how we can like schedule a follow-up meeting to fix those issues and so on. No, I, I, that is so fascinating to me. And I don't think that's something that we've ever touched on on the show is, is knowing your role and, and knowing, uh, when you, when you've solved the problem enough. So there's always this trade off in data science between the solution and the time that you have, right? You can essentially make any model better if you have infinite time. You'll probably never make it perfect, but you can incrementally mm -hmm. improve it with the however much time that you're given. But on the flip side is that time, do you get diminishing marginal returns for the time that you've invested in that solution? And I think that that is one skill that I know I have not <laughs> mastered yet. I, I don't know if anyone can master it, but it is so valuable. And you know, to that point, talking about the differences in projects, it seems like with a lot of software engineering projects, the payout is clear, but it comes later in the process. You know, it's important to be iterative and, and to put something out there, but the payoff comes from producing something and having a clear deliverable, having a new feature, whatever it might be. In data science, the payoffs come incrementally, but in theory, they can come sooner and, and more unexpectedly. So it's harder to plan for, but the resources that you allocated, it can sometimes take less resources than you thought, because sometimes if you, if you again, you have good data scientists, they're trying to solve a problem. They're not trying to, um, to like engineer a solution, which is what a lot of the times we can do is they're like, oh, we have this small problem, but we've built this crazy uh, model, whatever it is, to 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 solve this problem that could have been solved by a, a lot easier methodology. For example, we were working with a with a team a while ago, and uh, we had this solution that was a it was a simulation solution to to predict a certain outcome or, or to evaluate a distribution of certain outcomes, and some partners that we were working with, they said, oh, this needs a machine learning solution. We need to do this, we need to do this. Our simple simulation, a simple Monte Carlo simulation did so much better than any of the machine learning solutions that were, that were feasible because it just wasn't a machine learning problem. And, and I think that data scientists should be able to go in and understand, hey, like it isn't always a deep learning that solves a problem, right? It could be a simple simulation. It might just be a, a decision tree or just an if else statement that solves this problem. And that can save a company millions of dollars, right? <laughs> yeah, so there are some ways that, I mean, there are some very important learnings from these kind of experiences and um, that we can apply to organizational design. A lot of the time, like, what I'm seeing quite often is that uh, when relatively large company uh, decides to build their own data science team, and they are thinking, oh my God, we have so much data. We should be able to extract so much insight. We are going to optimize this funnel. We are going to optimize this pipeline. We are going to be able to tell uh, which locations should we open up next and, and so on. And they're really treating this whole data science team as kind of like a black box. You come to them, you tell them what you are, uh, like what you're interested in, 
and uh, wait a couple of weeks and see, see what comes out of it. And this doesn't always work. Um, it's very nice to draw this on the org chart as a saying like, hey, we are this amazing, new, cool, hip company with our own data science team. Here it is in this corner. Uh, they're all working super hard. But um, this organizational design doesn't exactly lead to optimal results. Again, I don't want to overgeneralize because there are different kinds of uh, workflows, different kinds of companies, different kinds of problems. But uh, almost always you are better off moving your data scientists closer to, uh, to the business stakeholders. Uh, you maybe even don't want to have a dedicated data science team. What you really want to have are data scientists super close to people who are solving a certain problem. You might even go out and say, hey, VP of marketing, I know that you are not a data scientist by, by trade, but uh, it's actually super easy to uh, open up this tool, write a SQL query, and see how uh, our campaigns are performing. And suddenly you eliminate a lot of potential for confusion because what data scientists are really good at is finding answers to, uh, to problems. But the problems can't really be specified very well upfront. Like if I want to find out you know, what is my, uh, like if I'm going to open up a new store and I'm going to decide which city I should open it up in. Um, I might ju just as well uh, get much more value from from the fact that uh, this, like, the idea of opening up a store is not a good one in the first place. Like, we should be moving online. But if you are going to go to data scientists, like, they really don't really have a choice here, and they just have to go in and really do this like super in-depth analysis to figure out that maybe Boston might be the best uh, best avenue, even though the question should be posed uh, in a different way. And if you go and you build out your data science team like this, uh, you essentially start to treat them as, as a black box, you are missing out a lot of these, these insights, uh, which you know sometimes might be the best you can do because of other uh, organizational constraints. But if you can find a way how to move analysts and data scientists closer to, to people who are asking the problems, let them actually try to see how people work. Like let's say that you are a data scientist working with a, like a marketing team. Like if you all you have see, like all you see is that stream of data, like stream of events in, in BigQuery, you might not even realize that there are, oh my God, so many more opportunities to do this A-B test and this A-B test and just like solve actually much bigger problem than the one that you have been given. Yeah, that that's something I, I'm routinely seeing in my consulting work is that data science adoption is really hard if everything is coming out of a black box and a machine, right? It's an incredible organizational behavior problem where you're looking at data science as this thing rather than a, as a collection of the work that people are doing. And to be able to have data scientists go out in the field and talk to people, one that builds their subject area expertise, which is very important for, for them coming to solutions, but it also establishes this trust from the organization because they realize that these data scientists are people, they are problem solvers, they're not that different from each other. I mean, I, I look at data science for, for some data science roles, not, not research or not necessarily MLE roles, but a lot of data science roles are a perfect hybrid between software engineering and consulting. Where you're coming in, you should be more as much a problem solver as you are a solution builder. And part of problem solving is asking the right questions, eliciting feedback, understanding and digging in. And, and a lot of the time in, in companies, maybe not the most tech forward ones, not Google, not whatever it might be. But in a lot of companies, mo a bunch of the data that you get and the information that you get is from human to human interac interaction, asking people what the pain points are in their workflow or, or diving deeper into certain things. And I think that that aspect of data science is often overlooked. We get really excited about the incredible models, but we lose sight 
of the human element and the, and the need for communication in the space. And I know that sounds a little touchy feely, but I see it over and over again with businesses where they don't understand data science because it's not humanized. And they also don't use data science because they're afraid of it. They don't understand it. And it just leads to this sort of downward spiral of like, oh, you said you're this, you know, data science was going to save us money, but they've done two projects and we've lost money on both of these projects. Well, it's like, yeah, that's not how data science work. Mm -hmm. If you talked with a data scientist, you'd know that like a couple of these projects, we're not going to find anything, but in the projects where our models and, and our, our skills are really being leveraged well, we're going to save or make an incredible amount of money for the company. So there are already some best practices that most data scientists and ML, or ML engineers are all about. Like one of them is that if you are going to build out a model, uh, you should probably classify the first hundred instances by hand. Like you should actually go and see if you can guess the optimal outcome just by using your own human intuition. Because that's how you'll realize that how like how your data set is queuing, uh, what are the difficult parts around it, like what are uh, like what all those features actually mean. And why can't we just take it one step further and really like just seeing how much that initial uh, domain knowledge just from those first hundred examples, like how much value they are going to give you. Like why can't we go one step further and really like sit down and talk and see how, uh, sit, talk with the people who produced the data set to see how they are thinking about uh, this problem, uh, how much more additional intuition uh, this is going to give you. I absolutely love that. That's something that I, I learned the hard way. It's really important to do. So I was working at a large uh, manufacturing company doing data science there. And I had this data set and we were trying to determine if we should tear down an engine or not. And what we realized is the the dependent variable was always someone's decision. So it was not based on any of the data. It was just, just like arbitrarily made by this, this one person. And the best our model could do was predict when that person should tear down the engine or when that person would tear down the engine, not if the engine should be torn down. So we had to go back and realize that, hey, like, our data is is not is not of high quality. We can't really use this, so we have to move on to a different way of looking at this problem, whether it's damage, whether it's some of these other things, and just diving in and understanding how the data is collected, diving in and understanding like the the background or or why people are doing things can have incredible implications on the output of the work. I mean, I could have sat there and built this model that would have done probably worse than this person who has a lot of experience doing this every time. But, you know, the fact that I, myself and one of my mentors sat down and were like, okay, this model is not going to be good if we're doing it this way. We hopefully save the company a reasonable amount of money and not wasting our time on, on a question like that based on data that wasn't collected with a data scientist in mind. I spent some time in the past uh, working on, on ML models of this nature um, where, and this is kind of a common thing, like if you are getting into the field, um, a lot of these uh, examples or uh, exercises are, for example, around predicting a box office uh, success. If you're releasing a movie, you are kind of seeing some interesting features, like which, like when was this uh, movie released? Who was the director? Who is um, like who are the actors? Uh, how much budget there was uh, for a movie? You can scrape this all from from IMDb, and you can probably go out and do a pretty advanced model uh, around trying to figure out how much this movie is going to uh, earn in the in the box office. What well, people like if. If you just look at this data set and you read some introductory paragraphs, um, you are not going to realize something that uh, people in, in the industry already know. The single major, like the single most important feature uh, based on like how, how much uh, a movie is going to make on its opening weekend is in how many theaters it's going to be shown. And this 
is decision made by a human being. It's someone who just looks at the movie, does the deal with the studio, and just decides, well, I don't think this movie is going to do that well, I'm just going to put it on thousand screens. Um, versus if there is if it's an Avengers movie, we are thinking, well, this movie is going to uh, do well, I'm going to put it on every single screen there is in the United States and Canada, and I'm just going to push it uh, for as long uh, as I can. So, you know, just going super deep into, uh, into the entire process can really reveal things and can literally save you months of work that you could be spending on optimizing your, your algorithm for predicting box office success, because at the end of the day, you just can't. Like, it's not something that uh, is, is possible to estimate because you are really depending on this one human being uh, making the decision and that someone who has been in the industry for, you know, decades and has built up the intuition much better and can realize that even though all these features are just think that the movie is going to do well, but if Star Wars is opening up literally the same day uh, as, as your movie, like there's just no way how you're going to compete with it. No, I, I that that is such a cool story and, and it, something that's fairly enlightening to a lot of people, I think, is that so my, my friends run uh, Nick Wan and Meg run this data science competition called Sliced. So it's they live stream it. It's like Chopped, if you're familiar with the cooking show, but mm-hmm. for data science. And uh, they, they do this thing where they award points for what's called a golden feature. So if someone builds a, a special, like a specific uh, feature engineering component. So for example, they had weather data um, and what someone could, could uh, engineer is air density from what was given in the, and that would be what's known as a golden feature. And to me, what you just described is trying to understand like golden features that aren't necessarily in your data set, but could have huge linchpins for the success of an analysis or an understanding. Like, if you understand what you just described, like would, would you even really need to have a model for this? Probably not, unless you were just going to model this person's decision on the, the on how many theaters should uh, the movie should be put into. Yeah, um, at, the, at the end of the day, there are certain kinds of problems where no matter how good your model is, you are just never going to be able to beat a human being. It is so much cheaper to hire someone who is just going to, who has been looking at, um, at uh, you know, box office results for the past 10 years like that person is going to do a much better job uh, than your model ever will. And you can argue that your model can do this, you know, you can do 100 inferences per second. Like you can do this on so, like for so many countries, for so many theaters and so on. But at the end of the day, if there are like five movies per week, like you don't need to automate anything. You're literally better off just hiring that one person um, and letting them sit um, there for two hours per week, uh, giving their their opinions, rather than like employing a huge uh, data processing and data science team um, to get to some kind of a result. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you bring in the human element. I think that there are data science management techniques that you can use to help improve human prediction performance. And that's not something that we talk about is that if you have this one person and they're 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 doing a, a good job predicting movie outcomes, we can also say and let them know when they've done really well or when they've missed the mark. And giving that feedback humans in our decision making process, it's not necessarily unlike a machine learning model. With feedback, we can improve our predictions. And that to me is something that when you combine that with machine learning models is unbelievably fascinating and valuable. We can also use data and technology to create feedback loops, dashboards, whatever it is, so humans can get better at making predictions. This is something I've seen in uh, uh, baseball teams do, is their scouts will go out and evaluate players, and then after a year or two, the teams will go back and say, okay, scout number one, you did a great job selecting these players, but you really missed the mark on these two players. What happened? And we're using data again to to update that mental model that we have 
but we're combining it with machine learning. We're quantifying the outcomes of specific people. And I look at that as within the same vein or within the same domain as data science is that like, hey, how do we leverage the, the human side of data science and maximize that and optimize that as well? And that's a crazy cool problem and a, a crazy cool solution to a lot of questions. So what we are talking about here at the end of the day is we as data scientists have amazing access to lots of different data sources. We are able to feed this into, uh, into algorithms, uh, into our models, into our neural networks. We can do super cool and crazy stuff. But this is also partly because there might be an existing organization um, which has already set up like all these pipelines and now they are sitting somewhere in silos, in some kind of dashboard, in some kind of database where you have to go and you know specifically request an access for this specific column uh, because you are just you're new to the company and you might not have been able to get like all the um, all the all the access rights uh, just yet. Um, and this is something we are trying to also solve with uh, with DeepNode because right now data scientists are like sitting on this treasure trove of of really valuable data um, and as a result they might be the only ones who can do something with it uh, what we're trying to do at deep note is to essentially democratize this access to uh, to these really interesting insights and there are multiple ways how to go about this in an organization you can go and you can start uh, doing some kind of rotations, you can do uh, internal uh, talks around uh, how to write uh, SQL, how to do, how to write Python. Um, but you can also try to lower the barrier to entry for, for all these, uh, I wouldn't say non-technical folks, uh, because plenty of them are technical. They are pretty comfortable going in and learning pretty sophisticated tools. Uh, they just don't happen to include any code. And if you can build a really nice intuitive interface, which is going to allow you access to all the existing analysis, all the, uh, all the available data sets, it's kind of a human nature that once you see something working and you want to just like tweak it a bit, it's not dif that difficult to copy paste uh, the snippet of code, even though if you no have no idea how it works, and changes one variable which says, like, I see that my chart is like only like shows only the last 60 days, and I see that number 60 in that code that is going to change to 90. Uh, that's actually not that difficult to do, and pretty much anyone can do this. And this is something that we learned uh, while working on on data science notebooks, which can be used across the whole organization, is that plenty of time uh, the output of data scientists is some kind of a dashboard. Like you go and you build an amazing tool which allows the business stakeholders to just have a look and see what, what are the sales, like how is how, like what are the trends, how we are doing, what was the prediction, how we are uh, tracking on, uh, on our internal goals. And it's just a matter of time, usually two or three minutes until someone asks a follow-up question on the dashboard. And it's not a difficult question. They're just going to ask, yeah, this is showing me uh, the sales for, you know, for the whole country. But how about only California? Can you, can you pull it up for me? And unless, you know, if you have an organization where the only person who can answer the question is sitting somewhere in a corner on a different floor and you have to go and like create a ticket in, in Jira uh, to give that information, you are never, essentially never going to find out. But at the end of the day, it's just so easy to do. You just have to change one variable even if you are not technical, you'll probably find a way how to do it. Yeah, well, you know, that's something that I also think is really overlooked in this domain. Like, yes, we're delivering dashboards, but for the most part, even for some of the most advanced machine learning models, there are intermediary steps that need to be taken and need to be put in the hands of the business stakeholder, right? If, if I'm delivering a solution to them and the first time they see the solution, the first time they can interact with the solution is right before it's supposed to go into production, 
that's not a good thing. Like, it, you know, if if the first iteration of the model, they can go in and they can put in whatever uh, variables that they want and see what the output is. To me, that's a win. They are using this model. They're building their own understanding of what this is doing. And they can also give feedback from their subject area expertise. And products like DeepNote allow you to give that additional iterative step to analysts as well as the stakeholders. And I think that that's something that, you know, I've talked a lot about data science adoption. I think that that's really important is stakeholders feeling like they're a part of this process. We talked a lot about data science black boxes before. And I think that that's one of the best ways to break out of that black box ideology is, is to let people in, in friendly ways, see what's going on under the hood. I mean, you're never going to under you're never going to explain how essentially like the models work from a math perspective to a stakeholder, but you can let them play around with the model and put in their own inputs and see what the outputs are, or you can show them a graph of the, of the inputs versus the outputs or feature importances or something along those lines. And I love that you guys are facilitating that conversation because I think that that conversation is what makes data science successful in organizations. And that's exactly what we have been seeing. Uh, really, the best organizations out there already realize this and they are already building some kind of tools internally to help with this. Like if you have, you know, if you have an organization at the scale of Google, you can, it literally makes sense for you to build your own data science notebook, which follows all these principles. You have data scientists, you want them to use the same tool as uh, other people in the company because you don't want to create any kind of silos. And building this tool is not exactly the easiest thing ever. Um, first of all, it's a very hard technological problem because we have to figure out all these things around infrastructure, uh, all these things around building the actual app. But they also have to figure out how can you simplify that uh, that environment so that people who have don't have a phd in um, in computer science can actually understand what those buttons mean uh, and this is unfortunately something they just have to spend a lot of time iterating on and talking to a lot of users uh, and seeing how they are becoming the power users how they are able to get additional value from from the software as they uh, keep learning more and more about it. Um, but if you are not a company on Google scale, like how can you do something like this? You're essentially left to your own devices. If you have a 100 or 200 person company, you are definitely not going to build your own internal data science notebook just to the data scientists uh, and business stakeholders can be more efficient about sharing the insights. Um, and this is also one of the reasons why we just really like, couldn't just keep looking at the state of, of the market because this was kind of becoming super obvious thing to do. And it really wasn't something that any single organization would be able to uh, build, uh, build out themselves. But at the same time, it's a problem that pretty much everyone feels and tries to find a way how to solve. Yeah, and that's something you touched on something at how with how Google can do something, but other people can't. I find that there's a big divide in in companies that have started with machine learning and technology in mind, like that is part of their mission, that is part of what's been their competitive advantage, and companies that are are realizing that data science, machine learning, AI can improve the quality of their products and, and their platform or whatever they're doing, but they still have, but they didn't start in that technology space. Like the philosophy of companies that are coming in that that um, is already in line with machine learning, they sort of know some of these things intuitively and they're probably actively building things that facilitate their workflows. But these companies that are trying to make that transition, I think that that platforms and tools are one of the most effective ways to be able to help them make that transition. Because, you know, again, they wouldn't go out and build these things themselves. They wouldn't have the know-how, but they might not also understand the importance or want to. But if you bring in 
tools and platforms that allow this sharing, allow this information, it creates that information, uh, like it creates a, it starts to create a culture shift because people start using them. There's this different wave of adoption that goes through an organization rather than it being top down, it's now bottom up. And to me, that's an incredible force for positive change in a lot of companies. And, you know, like, you know, deep note, for example, is, is in, in some senses free in some senses, very affordable in my mind a lot of these platforms like why not try them why not experiment because it can create that organizational change from the individual contributor level which i think is so so valuable within the space absolutely and that's at the end of the day that's what you would like to see like you don't want to go in and say the top down that from now on everyone needs to be data driven you it's actually want to yeah. <laughs> you actually want people to do this the real, like have this realization by themselves, like get that internal buy-in and uh, just get everyone on the same page of like what, like how much more efficient, how much better you can be uh, in, uh, like in doing your work if you have access to, to those data sets, if you can you know, share the insights um, and uh, just, you know, just even like being able to like see the the step change in your in the way how you worked a year ago compared to uh, now that you have uh, all these all these data sets available. Incredible. So I want to be sensitive of your time. I, that's also all the questions that I really had. Um, do you have any kind of final thoughts, words of advice, uh, anything along those lines that you'd like to share? There are there are things that we have noticed um, as we are building, you know, like we spend lots of time uh, in in data science notebook space, and we spend a lot of time also talking uh, here at this podcast uh, about you know notebooks and how they fit into uh, into companies. Um, this is a pretty hot topic, and I feel like it's a pretty hot topic for a very good reason. Um, for a very long time, there was this really huge gap between what you can do in a spreadsheet and suddenly you hit the ceiling, you kind of like just can't put in any more, uh, any more rows into it, or you just like your logic becomes so complicated, uh, and it takes so much, so long to, to recalculate. Um, and there's like such a big gap of saying like, Cool. I have to step up to some some more advanced tool, and essentially all you had, all you could do was to download PyCharm or or VS Code, and just like see a completely new new interface. And that's where where the notebooks uh, are are stepping in. Like you can actually bridge these two worlds. Like you can have something that's as intuitive as as a spreadsheet, but can you take you much further, and you can keep working in the same environment. And essentially build something which is as powerful as you ever build have been building it from you know from an id uh, right from the start incredible I, I mean i think from talking about you know organizational behavior to how to manage different teams this has been such a, a cool and interesting interview uh, i'm also glad we got to talk about the exact use case and the value that you guys have created with deep note so Jakob, thank you so much for for coming in and i i really enjoyed this i think everyone tuning in will enjoy this as well yeah thanks a lot can really enjoy this as well